Honorable Dr. Kenny Anthony, former Prime Minister of St. Lucia and the current Parliamentary Representative for Viewfort South, Mrs. Paul Termel John, the Honorary Council of Canada in St. Lucia, Ms. Raisa Joseph, Executive Director of the Folk Research Center, Acting Commissioner of Police Ronald Phillip, Dr. Madri Jameson Charles, Principal of the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College and our keynote speaker, Superintendent of Police Albert Shallery with responsibility for the Southern Division of Police, other members of the Royal St. Lucia Police Force, Ms. Mondi Lewis, the Press Secretary to our Prime Minister, Honorable Philip G. Pierre, members of the Board of Directors of Raise Your Voice St. Lucia Inc. and staff members, community leaders, residents of Ufort and Environs, our footballers, members of the media and our students from the University of Birmingham, UK, who are currently hosting a legal aid and mental health clinic in collaboration with Raise Your Voice St. Lucia Inc. Everyone, welcome. My name is Eleanor Joseph Sprott, and for the next hour or so, I will assist you as your guide through this program. Today, we are here at the Philip Masley Ground in Viewfort as we do a project launch, launch um, for psycho psychosocial support and resources for women and girls, boys and men from the Mang and Bruceville to overcome challenges. To welcome you, I now invite President and Co-Founder of Raise Your Voice St. Lucia, Miss Catherine Sillies. Let's put our hands together for her. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And I would like to observe the protocols that has already been set. Um, I want to take a moment to remember Dr. Henry Charles. We um, the two of us sat down at Rituals Coffee House and put this project together because um, both of us were concerned about the future of young people in the Mang and Bruceville. So we put the project together. He was supposed to be here to do the keynote speaker. But um, we all know that um, we make plans, but the universe decides otherwise. So his wife, Dr. Marjorie Jameson Charles, has offered to do the honors and do the keynote speaker. Um, so today we gather here with a sense of profound purpose and shared determination. We stand united to address the critical issues that has deeply affected Viewfort the devastating impact of gun violence on the well-being and mental health of our citizens here in the South. We had the opportunity to serve people in the South during this um, crisis, and um, we have gotten to know some of them quite well. And we believe that with help, we can all come out of this situation better. I present to you a project that aims to provide much needed support to those two communities. As we come together, we recognize the immense challenges that these communities have faced and the profound trauma that has resulted. This project is funded by the Canada Fund for Local Initiatives, CFLI, and we want to express our profound gratitude to the government and people of Canada for their generosity. The projects include a community assessment so that the community can tell us what they need, what they want, and how they want things done on their behalf. For very often, we continue to give people what we think they need and not what they actually want. 
a stakeholder engagement because we want to understand the concerns and the contributions and the responsibilities of the business community in Viewfort and how do we support everybody in order to make this community what we know. A public education and awareness campaign based on the information out of the community assessment, the community will tell us what do we want to do and how we want to do it. A skills building and empowerment component for young people in the two communities from age 15 to 35 to learn a skill and to get the opportunity to open a small business or get a job. Psycho psychological support for residents who request it and monitoring and evaluation of the current situation to understand what is best. So I was born in Viewfort. I was born in Peru in Viewfort and people tend to forget that because I've lived in Castries for a long time. I was born at St. Jude's in Peru. I was raised behind the Catholic church in Viewfort. I attended the Belvide um, Infant School the girls primary school, the Viewfort Junior Secondary School up the road. So I am from Viewfort. So before we say that Castries people want to tell them what to do, I want to clear myself. I am from Viewfort. So in the face of adversity, it is essential that we extend the helping hand to those who have suffered so deeply. Our project seeks to create a supportive and healing environment where the members of those communities can find resilience and hope. The core objectives of this project works towards rehabil rehabilitating the lives of those affected. We can sit here and say from our experiences in interacting with Viewfort people that they have been deeply affected. They are not comfortable in their community and we want to um, contribute for people feeling safe and comfortable in their communities, and they do not feel that any time they may come for me. Through collaborative efforts and community engagement, we endeavor to foster a safe space for open dialogue and meaningful connections where individuals can share their experiences, fears, and aspirations without judgment, our team of dedicated professionals and volunteers will be at the forefront of this effort, ensuring that the support services are accessible, culturally sensitive, and tailored to the unique needs of each individual. We have a policy at Raise Your Voice St. Lucia where we always ask people, what do you want me to do for you? And sometimes it takes a little bit of time for the person to realize just what I need, but we always believe allowing people to say what they need is very important and contributes to the success of any endeavor taken on their behalf. It is crucial to understand that the scars of gun violence run deep and can often remain hidden behind um, facades. Therefore, we will focus on raising awareness about mental health and destigmatizing those seeking help. We will empower the community members to recognize signs of distress in themselves and the loved ones and encourage them to seek the support they need without hesitation. This project is not merely about addressing the aftermath of a strategy, but about building a stronger, more resilient community that stands together in solidarity. As we embark on this journey, we look to promote healing, compassion, and understanding. We will work to restore a sense of safety and trust within the communities, thereby fostering an environment conducive to growth and positive change. However, it is crucial to recognize that this endeavor requires the collective efforts of each and every one of us. We call upon local organization, government bodies, community leaders, and individuals to join hands and contribute to their unique expertise, resources, and time to this cause. Together, we have the power to make a significant impact and uplift the lives of those who have suffered immeasurably. 
Our commitment to this project will shape the future of those communities and pave the way for a brighter future. In closing, let me remember that by supporting each through adversity, we demonstrate the strength of our collective humanity. The road ahead may be challenging, but with unwavering determination, the power of unity, we shall all succeed over the shadows of gun violence, and together we shall forge a path towards healing, hope, and renewal for the community members, specifically for the young people within those communities, as they are, as we always say, they are our future. We have to work towards they being our future and a life to be the future that we always speak about. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Silis. It is indeed heartening to head the overall um, objective of this project to bring healing, to bring hope, renewal in this beautiful community called Viewfort. Um, like Miss Silis, I am from Viewfort also, not from the Viewfort town, but I am also from Piero, right up there in the hills of Viewfort North. And Viewfort is the town that I come to for almost all my commercial services. And it is a beautiful place just a little scarred right now. And I know that there is a lot of hope because if we just look to the back of the tent, we see our young men standing in their white shirts. That is our future. That's the hope. And these are the individuals that we're working with and for. I like the idea that this project is not one where we come to bring them a program, but rather where we seek to sit with the community and find the needs and therefore tailor projects and programs that are needed and wanted. So there is buy-in and ownership from the members and, um, of the community and um, we can see Viewfort rise again. I now, Pause once more as we welcome to give um, opening remarks, Miss Mrs. Paul Tomel John from the High Commission of Canada. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. First of all, I would like to apologize. I'm sitting down because the back is not following today. So. Thank you for your understanding. Um, I would like to adopt the protocol as already established. Um, so good morning to everybody. It is my pleasure to be here with all of you to offer remarks on behalf of the Government of Canada. High Commissioner, Her Excellency Liliane Chatterjee, sends warm regards and greetings and regrets that she's unable to be here today to officially launch Raise Your Voices new project supported by the Canada Fund for Local Initiatives. The Canada Fund for Local Initiatives, or CFLI as it is commonly known, is a unique funding mechanism with relatively, mm, like that, um, with um, relatively modest support, um, lo local partners carry out innovative and impactful projects that are responsive to the co their community needs. CFLI is much more than simply providing financial contributions. It is a partnership between Canada and local stakeholders to advance our shared priorities to make our societies more peaceful and prosperous. While the Canada Fund is open to a wide range of eligible beneficiaries, including government agencies, academic institutions, and some international organizations, the vast majority of CFLI projects are implemented by local civil society organizations like Raise Your Voice. 
Canada is committed to building its partnerships with local civil society organization in St. Lucia and across the Eastern Caribbean. Why? Because our government firmly believes that civil society organizations are instrumental to promoting diversity and inclusion, defending human rights, and holding governments accountable to their citizens. CSO, or civil society organizations, often work directly with communities. They, they understand their challenges and they are uniquely positioned to respond. Raise Your Voice is known in St. Lucia and throughout the wider region as a leading advocate for women, children, and other marginalized groups who have experienced gender-based violence. A respected organization and a trusted partner, Canada's relationship with Raise Your Voice dates back to 2017 when they received their first CFLI contribution to carry out a public education campaign on, on gender-based violence and to advocate for legislative reform during the 16 days of activism. In the years since, our partnership has grown to include an additional CFLI project in 2020 to respond to the urgent needs of gender-based gender violence survivors at the height of COVID-19 pandemic. Additionally, Raise Your Voice was one of three St. Lucian organizations that participated in the Canada-funded Women's Voice and Leadership Caribbean Program, an initiative which invests in the power of local women's rights and LGBTQI plus organizations to advance their own agenda across critical themes. Throughout this uh, project, Raise Your Voice received funding to deliver critical support services to clients, to upgrade a counseling room for the vulnerable person unit of the Royal St. Lucia Police Force, to outfit an office for their operation, and to advocate for the enactment of St. Lucia's domestic violence bill. Canada is exceptionally proud that our support over the years to raise your voice contributed in part to the passage of the landmark Domestic Violence Act. This statute was the result of a tireless advocacy from activists and organizations such as Raise Your Voice and serves as a model to the rest of the Caribbean on inclusion legislation. Today, we continue our support to Raise Your Voice, demonstrating Canada's steadfast commitments to St. Lucia and its people. Violent crime, including gun violence, is on the rise, particularly in Vieux Canada firmly believes that peace and prosperity are everyone's birthright. The primary aim of the project entitled Psychological Support and Resources for Women and Girls, Boys and Men from Communities in Vieux-Fort to Overcome Challenges is to assess the effect of this uptick in crime and a cross -section, on a cross-section of vulnerable St. Lucian and to assist with mitigating its impact on the community at large. The project is grounded on an inclusive approach to peace building by engaging diverse segments of the population. When addressing security challenges, society benefits from a comprehensive and inclusive approach. Inclusion is a path to peace and prosperity. This small, uh, this small scale advocacy project complements other security focused support Canada is providing to St. Lucia to the regional security system 
as well as our anti-crime capacity building program to prevent and respond to threats posed by transnational criminal activity. Through its wide-ranging international assistance programming, Canada also partners with St. Lucia in its efforts to strengthen economic and climate resilience while advancing inclusive governance and gender equality. Canada commends, raise your voice for your continuous and compassionate advocacy on preventing gender-based violence and your responsiveness to re-emerging challenges such as increased gun violence. Canada is proud to support local organization in their efforts to build stronger and more resilient communities, thereby contributing towards a safer and more prosperous world for all of us. I wish all project partners, volunteers, participants, and stakeholders success over the next eight months. We look forward to the positive outcomes. We thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Termel John, for giving us some more insight as to why this project is so important. Um, and we can never stress how much um, partnership is important in community development and nation building. And we are certainly pleased that your government chooses to partner with us here in St. Lucia. And so we thank the people of Canada and we thank the, the Canada Fund for local initiatives for being partner with Raise Your Voice St. Lucia Inc. We can never stress enough how much inclusion is important to us as a people. And as a small community, um, Viewfoot, sometimes with um, what happens within and around us, we may feel excluded. We may feel that we are segregated. We may feel stigmatized. But one of the aims of this program is to allow Viewfoot to be safer, to be more productive, and therefore to be part of the general development of St. Lucia as a developing state. Again, we thank you and we thank your government for your contribution towards community and nation building. We now welcome to, to the lectern the parliamentary representative for Viewfort South, Honorable Dr. Kenny Anthony, who will speak with us briefly on the urgency and importance of addressing gun violence in the communities of the Mang and Bruceville here in Viewfort. Dr. Anthony. Thank you very much, Chairperson. May I first of all extend a warm welcome to all our distinguished visitors and presenters, and I extend an even warmer welcome to all my constituents who are here today. I mean, you know, you're the most important persons in this audience. But I think you'll also forgive me if I extend a very special welcome to the students from the University of Birmingham who are here. Um, Birmingham is where I did my PhD, so I have a very special relationship with the University of Birmingham. And I had the opportunity to meet some students from Birmingham University, I think it was sometime last year, on their tour of duty. So, welcome to Solution. I hope you enjoy your stay with us, and in particular, your engagement with the individuals in my constituency, all without my knowledge. So. Very special welcome, a very special welcome to you. I particularly like the fact that this project is inclusive, that it seeks to reach the women of our community, the men of our community, the girls and the boys. Particularly, I particularly um, like that about this project. But you know, I am known for being disobedient 
And um, I'm not necessarily going to stick to that text. I want to say a few words about the mothers in our community. I want to speak about their, their pain and their hurt. And if you want a, another way of putting it, I want to the pain, the cries, and the tears, and then go beyond that in, in a few minutes. I am happy that we have the young men with us and young ladies, the footballers of Euphort, um, because some of the things I want to say about mothers will also touch them, though in a very tangential way, because time is, and time is, time is an issue. I believe... You know it's not a myth in St. Lucia that when you curse the mother of a young man, he reacts almost violently. Apparently, you have the freedom to, to curse the father. You can even curse a man's wife, but never curse the mother. The young man then reacts with, with reacts um, aggressively and often um, promises violence in return because for him this is an affront. Um, it's a breach of his code of, of, of honor and the peculiar and special relationship that he has with his, with his mother. It is part of the psyche, part of our tradition, part of our culture, and not often spoken about, but it is very evident. So, you can say anything about a young man's mother, but don't trespass and don't curse her. I don't know if it has to do with the rather colorful curses which we have inherited from the French. And as you know, the, these curses are usually most colorful and effective if delivered in Creole. I will not take the risk today of repeating the curses to you, although... Having grown up in the south of the island, I know those curses only too, too well. But it seems to me that the reverence that the young men and women have for their parents, for their mothers in particular, somehow does not always translate into other things. And this is where perhaps I want to touch them a little bit by talking about some of the issues that we face. No doubt. We suffer more intense pain when our mothers are affected. And I suspect you probably would say it's, it's biological because of this unique umbilical connection between mother and child. I think it's very real. And for me, without confessing too much, when my own mother died, it was very difficult and traumatic, even though she lived a life of 94 years, but it was very painful. And I remember I had to do the eulogy at her funeral. And uh, um, I always pity those who have to deliver eulogies for one parent or the other, especially a mother, because of the deep chord that um, resonates. You, you, you have to pull from your very being and your soul to be able to speak and say what you'd like to say. So it's, a lot of it is umbilical um, to, a very large, to a very large extent. But then, well, on whether or not there is an umbilical connection, the special relationship between child and mother is very, very real. And I want to share with you what, has, what I've picked up over the years as a political practitioner as someone representing a constituency for over 25 years. In my experience, it is always the mothers who come to my office for assistance of one kind or another. Almost invariably, it's the mothers who are coming to look for jobs. Almost invariably, it is the mothers who are coming on behalf of their children particularly to the young men like you see behind us there, asking for jobs for them. Almost invariably. It is rare that a father will turn up in my office and say, my son or daughter is unemployed and I would be happy if you can assist me to get a job. Or can you help 
with the education of that child. Very, very, very rare. Doesn't happen. I have difficulties sometimes because when the mothers show up on behalf of their sons in particular, I quarrel with them. I say, why are you coming to speak to me and not your son? Why is it that it is not your son who is asking for a job or who is asking for help to complete education? And I say to them, you are doing a disservice to your son. If you want me to help, send them. I want to talk to them. And the reason I do this is to say to the mothers, you have to build confidence in your own children. They have to learn to take responsibility for themselves. They can't continue to be dependent on their mothers all the time. But you know it betrays something deeper in our society. The lack of confidence among our young men to handle their affairs and to handle their business. It also signals a breakdown in the relationship that it is the mothers who are constantly exerting the pressures on the children to do what is right, to do what is good, to do what is necessary. And quite often, they're not reacting. And so, this is a wonderful opportunity that we have to speak to all the actors, all who are involved in shaping our communities. And that is why, for example, I welcome the fact that we are going to touch the lives of just not just mothers and fathers, but also their children. And I'm saying to the young men who are in this crowd today, some of them who are standing in that tent over there, they have to learn to stand on their own two feet and stop burdening their mothers with their problems. And they have to learn to handle their problems on their own. If you want a football boots or football pants, don't send your mother to me to ask for football boots or football pants. You come on your own and argue your case. Learn to develop your skills and to build your confidence. That is my point. But you know who have suffered most in the carnage that afflicted our community in the past few months? It's the mothers. And there are moments when I wonder whether these young men who engage in these criminal activities, who take down the lives of others, understand the human tragedy that is involved. What it means to a mother to have a son murdered or what it means to a mother to have a partner murdered or what it means um, to a mother to have a son incarcerated because of a criminal act. And what's the responsibility? Mothers are torn to protect their children instinctively. The tragedy is that few of them are going to summon the courage to admit their children committed wrong. Rather, what they will seek to do is to put a cloak around the children, sanitize them as if, to, as if all pretending, as if they could not be that son or individual who inflicted pain. And I have spoken time and time again of the impact of this on a small community like ours. You vote a small. You have a population of about nine to 10,000 voters. And can you imagine Clark Street, walking down Clark Street, watching the faces, and you are passing next to the young man or to the mother of the young man whom you suspected pulled that trigger and kill your son or kill the relative. How do you cope with, with all of this? How do you manage all of this in a small community like ours? How do you cope with this kind of, of tragedy? How do you respond to all of this? Yes, we speak of forgiveness. Forgiveness does have a place. We can't be burdened constantly by the wish and the desire to inflict revenge and to inflict pain.
But does it mean that those who commit those acts, even if we are prepared to forgive, should be allowed to roam free again and not atone for what they have done? Does it mean that? These are the difficult questions that we face. And I can tell you, law enforcement may not know who pulled the trigger or who killed who. May not know, but the chances are that the community knows exactly who did it and when they did it. And that's a different kettle of fish, whether those individuals can ever, ever feel the confidence to speak to law enforcement. That is so complex an issue. I'll probably spend an hour talking to you about it, which I have no interest in doing at this time. But you know what? We have made progress. In the last few weeks, we have made progress. And you have heard all about the progress. But in the progress we have made, even if we have had a setback last week when one young man was brought down again by violence, the persons who perhaps have been most constructive in this have been the mothers of the community. Because the groups that have intervened have spoken largely to the mothers to persuade them to learn to forgive, to speak about the pain they have had, to be able to reach out and touch another family whom they know harbored an assailant who committed one of those crimes. And so I want to give thanks and praise to the mothers in Beaufort who have played such a very constructive role in the last few weeks to deal with the issues which we have had um, in, in, in the community. Without their cooperation, we would not have made the progress that we have. But I want to share an experience with you and to emphasize the significance of the role of mothers. Some of you in this audience will know that I am working along with two other ex-prime ministers to see if we can bring peace to Haiti. Because Haiti is almost ungovernable these days, torn by violence and racked by violence. Gangs have taken over um, the Port-au-Prince in, in Haiti. And hundreds of Haitians have been murdered by gangs. And the challenge is, how do we restore peace and stability in Haiti? How do we conquer the warfare that the gangs have unleashed in Haiti? But something interesting happened in Haiti a couple months ago. The people of Haiti conquered their fear. And they decided that they would confront the criminals who have been wrecking havoc on their community, who have been unleashing this violence. And they created an organization called Bwakale. Now, if you're a Creole speaker and you hear the terms Bwakale, you immediately understand what Bwakale conveys, the message it conveys. And I don't want to interpret it for the audience that's here at all, because they will think I am irreverent and disrespectful. And I wouldn't want to be that, would I? And you know me already, I say things that people for some reason want always to exploit when they have the opportunity. But that's the name. And what it effectively meant was that this organization took it into their hands to begin to ferret out the criminals who were wrecking havoc and in turn commit acts of violence against those criminals to inflict upon the criminals the very violence which they were inflicted on law-abiding citizens. Now, very clearly, that is not the answer. Violence begets violence. And no community should feel empowered by using acts of violence to take lives of other persons. That's not the solution and can never be the solution, even if desperation invites you to invoke that solution. And that's not my message for you because in our discourse with the Haitian people, we tell them very clearly that we do not support this method of confronting community violence. 
that that kind of violence can never be justified or be right. And I would never ever want to prescribe that approach in our country. But there's an important lesson nevertheless to extract from what has, has occurred. It is that unless as a community we come together, unless the mothers take the fathers with them, hold their hands, unless the mothers can persuade the young men that there's an alternative to the lifestyle of violence, we will not conquer violence. We can only do so if we are together as a community. That's the lesson I extract from that experience in Haiti. That's why it's so important for what Raise Your Voice is doing. That is to say to try to mobilize the community and bring people together. But there's a vital ingredient in this. We have to conquer fear. We have to conquer fear. You can't confront violence if you don't conquer fear, if you don't fight fear. You are afraid. You are afraid to walk the streets. You are afraid at night. You are afraid to talk to certain persons in the community because if you talk to them, they're going to report you and then you may be gunned down. You are afraid to make information available because somehow you're fearful that the information will get out, which is a reality and that the police need to understand. We have to conquer fear. And as we seek to find a solution, somehow we have to empower all in our community, including our mothers, to confront this fear, this notion of fear. If we can't, then we're not going to conquer the issues of violence. But you know what? They have made giant steps to conquering fear. Because when they sat together in all the meetings that we had, or other groupings engaged in V4, they spoke to each other to conquer each other's fear. And we need to build on that, to build on conquering fear in our midst. Finally, let me say, because I have overstayed my welcome. I'm happy that there's a component in this project for self-sustainability. This is so critical and so important. We have to train our mothers in alternative livelihoods. The society has to take responsibility. The government has to take responsibility. And they have to take responsibility because these parents were never offered an alternative education or alternative lifestyle. The vast majority of them never went to a secondary school or even never had proper schooling, either because of their poverty or they saw no real value in education. And that's a state responsibility to provide education for citizens. And I'm not necessarily blaming this generation because it belonged to a generation in the past who did not proper understand the value and purpose of education in our communities. And those of you, some of you are very idealistic and believe education is always liberating. I'm not of that view at all. Because sometimes I see some of the worst offenses in this country being committed by people who are supposed to be educated, who have very colorful and powerful degrees next to their names. That's the issue. The issue is about who they are as ordinary people and as a citizen. Education is necessary and vital because it opens different kinds of pathways. If it doesn't transform you as a human being, then of what value is it to you and to others? But the fact is, irrespective of what we believe about education and the powers of education, we had a responsibility. And a lot of these parents were not afforded that opportunity. So we, now we have to retool. We have to retrain, and I'm happy that there's a self-sustaining component. But it must be realistic in what it pro pro promises and, and proposes. And I heard you, Catherine, when you said you got a rejoinder. You've people a right to respond that way, you know. Don't make that mistake. 
When they tell you that, they're right. And I don't blame them for saying so. Because you see too many others from outside below, because believe they feel they have the prescriptions for the community of Ufort and they do not ask the people of Ufort what it is they think is necessary for them and for their emancipation. They don't. They want to come and impose. And I see it in my life all the time that they have the answers for my constituency and they don't come and ask me what I think and what I believe, you don't do that. And that is why I want to applaud you on a second ground. First, for recognizing that psychological dimension. If you want to unlock the people of your fort, then you have to sit with them, be with them, explore with them. And so when you said in your comments, that you are seeking to find out from the constituency what it is that they want, what they would like to see. It is the right approach because it is a bottom-up approach and you're not pretending you are the vast reservoir of knowledge and skills that you're going to impose on them. So I applaud you for that. And I say to you that is the right way to go. And so the people of you fought, I invite you to cooperate with Raise Your Voices and I invite you to make use of this program, and I really, really look forward to the outputs and uh, to the success of this program. Thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Dr. Anthony. We appreciate your remarks, very sombering, very thought-provoking, as we focused heavily on the plight of mothers the women of this community. But I want to just highlight a few things you spoke of quickly. And the need, one of which is the need to raise a responsible and independent generation, especially of young men, a responsible and independent generation who can work collectively in raising Viewfort, in raising the standard here in Viewfort. In the good book, we are told that two are better than one. And though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. And if we're able to successfully merge the potential, the talent of the man and Bruceville, I am sure, I am positive that Viewfort will be a vibrant commercial center that even the North will envy. I now want to not take any more time, but at this moment, we want to invite our keynote speaker, um, Dr. Marjorie Jameson Charles. She is the current principal of the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College, and she will speak with us on the topic, the impact of gun violence on communities. Dr. Jameson Charles, welcome. Good morning, everyone. And I would like to adopt the protocol as already established. I also want to make a disclaimer. Like Catherine, I was born in Beaufort. I am from the South. Good things come from the South. I spent the first 10 years of my life on Clark Street, before. I was born at the hospital that is now called the Wellness Center. And my parents migrated to Castries, and they were, I, I attended um, Belvedere Primary, Infant and Primary, until my parents migrated to Castries, and I continued my secondary education in Castries. But in 2009, my mother returned to Beaufort. And I, as, and I was out of the country, but every time I come to St. Lucia, I stay in Beaufort from since 2009. So I, am, I know some of the issues that we are confronting with in Beaufort. And I, come, I stand here to try to represent Dr. Henry Charles, and I know I won't be able to do things that he would have done or how he would have presented the keynote. 
So yesterday evening when Catherine called and asked me whether I can do the keynote, I said, mm, okay, what do I say and how do I represent what Henry would like to say? So I'll try. I will not be able to put in the calypsos and all of the things he would put in when he does his presentation, but I will try my best to see how I can tackle the, the topic on, in terms of the impact of violence on communities. And I also want to speak to towards a public health model in developing peaceful communities. So I start and, and I want to talk about the issues related to violence as they pose sev severe challenges to the sustainable development of St. Lucia. And as we know, these issues have been subject, the subjects of intense public discussions and policy considerations among governments development planners, non-government sectors, young people and the network, families, community, the Facebook criminologists, because we have a lot of criminologists who are on Facebook who know everything about crime and how to, to solve it, and also the media. This is because of the negative impact on our economic performance, our public health, our productivity, our education, our well-being, and, and most importantly, the citizen security. So the real criminologists, many of them have given a number of, of, of reasons, a number of, of consequences of um, high rates of crime and violence. And also, I want to also say that I did a, some research in Anguilla, in, uh, on, on the impact of, cri uh, of crime and violence. And there's a survey among the, among the prisoners, the education, education, and everyone who was, who were in fact, who, who were part of the community. So one of the things that we, that we have, we, we see in research is that, that the high rates of gun violence would directly threaten the physical safety and well-being of individuals within a community. And we saw that because people would feel unsafe, they would not want to go outside and they wouldn't want to public to, to engage in social activities and they spend the time at home because they did not want to be part of it. Constant exposure to crime and violence can lead increase, to increased stress, anxiety, and trauma among community members, and we saw that too when we had the high state of, of crime and violence in the South. There was also the fear of victimization, and that can create a per pervasive sense of unease and negatively, negatively impact mental health, and we heard our um, esteemed colleague, Dr. Kenny and Anthony, speak to that. The fear of crime, and he spoke about fear also, can lead to what we call social isolation. And social isolation is that where people avoid going outside or interacting with others. This isolation can also weaken the social bonds that we have in our community, and it will reduce what we call community cohesion. And also, it would also erode trust among our neighbors because nobody wants to say anything because they don't want to get, some people say this person say that and so on. Another thing we also were able to see, and even though the research said that and we were able to see that firsthand, is that the high rates of crime can deter businesses from operating in that particular area. So therefore, the economic activity is decreased. And then therefore, it affects our employment opportunities. And, and people may not want to invest in or move to our community because of the reputation that it may have in terms of what we call, I, I spent 13 years in Trinidad, what they call a hotspot area. Social schools located in these in high, in high crime areas may struggle to provide a safe and conducive learning environment and students' ability to focus and learn might be compromised due to the stress and trauma caused by crime and violence. And I'm, I'm sure we saw that the last, um, during the last time. Now, communities with high crime rate often have low property value. 
because no one wants to come and live there. Okay, so therefore we have this cycle of disinvestments, and and that as a as a result, the, a decline in the overall neighborhood quality because no one wants to come and live there. And then we talk about crime, the impact of crime on community health by limiting access to public spaces and recreational facilities. Nobody wants to go and play on the field and so on and so forth because they're afraid. And they avoid parks, they avoid the playgrounds and other outdoor activities because of the fear of crime. And then also in terms of social services, a high crime rate can divert resources from social services and community development efforts. And we look at when you see law enforcers and emergency services might, be, might require more funding um, and, and, and so it would leave less money for programs, developmental programs that may want to address the root cause of crime. Children grow up in communities plagued by crime and violence are often exposed to traumatic experiences that can affect the development and future opportunities. So that, that cycle of crime continues. And we talk about the high crime rates can undermine community empowerment and engagement because people, they become disengaged from civic opportunities activities and community organization because they feel helpless. Where am I going? I can't do that. And then we look at the high crime areas and, and what do you call them hotspots? They are stigmatized. So they have negative stereotypes and, so, and discrimination among the residents of the community. So you come from the Mang, I come from Booseville. So, uh, and that would marginalize the community. And we know that that Sometimes it's just one person or two people in a particular community that may, may have um, uh, exhibited these kinds of behavior, but then the whole community is stigmatized. And then we also have the high crime areas. As we have strained relationship between law, enforcement, and the community. And I'm sure our esteemed um, colleagues here would, would, would be able to identify with that. And so we would have excessive policing that can lead to mistrust, while limited resources might mean that not all crime deserve attention. So we have, I'm sure we all, we could, we all could speak to that. Now they have a lot of recommendations. People have recommended a number of programs to place crime, to address crime and violence. But a lot of these programs do not adequately address what we, so they are necessary, but not sufficient. And we also know at the School of Public op Opinion on crime prevention activity, you get harsh recommendation, unyielding recommendation. And as I said, the citizens would want accountability from the elected officials. So they want to know what is the MP doing? What's the government doing? What's who doing what? Who's doing what? Okay? So especially when some of these violence are done by youth, on you. The news is further sensationalized to accentuate fear and intolerance. So the call for punitive um, solution to what is marked as escalating youth violence uh, does not adequately address this um, issue that we are grappling with. So I know the government has been asked to um, implement crime um, prevention at activities through education, to address perceived inequality and inequity, provide job opportunities, targeting the marginalized urban poor. Remember, I don't, I notice I don't say at risk you, because we are all at risk. Uh, it doesn't have to be just because you live in a particular area that you are at risk, because I know there are people who live in, in affluent areas who are at risk also. Um, so we're looking at, the, um, so we're looking at um, a number of approaches and one of the approaches that um, Henry and I speak to a lot in our work is the public health approach in developing programs to prevent and reduce violence. So such an approach does not replace criminal justice or other crime pre preventing approaches. Instead, it complements them by bringing diff a different view and other important players to the table and it also equips us with tools and resources, okay, to prevent and to reduce crime. So as we, as we 
in the in the fiftieth anniversary of Caricom, the public health model was articulated, and as of the new principle of South Lewis, it is a priority area for us. In and we have it long as our research agenda in looking at the the, the public health model of of pre crime prevention. So what the public health does, it focuses on the health of communities and the population. So wherever possible, interventions focus on populations at greater risk of disease and injury. So the public health approach aims to preserve, to promote, and to improve health. So what it does, it emphasizes preventing disease or injury from occurring or recurring rather than treating the consequences. And what we have been doing a lot is treating the consequences. So what the public health model use is a systematic scientific approach to understanding and preventing violence to answer. Uh, to answer. Also, we are going to ask the question, where does the problem begin? And how can we prevent it from occurring? Okay, so there are multiple steps in the public health approach, and each step is informed by the next. And many people, many organizations and systems are involved in each step, and, and, and Catherine's proposal speaks to that public health approach. So, we, so there are four steps that are used most in most, in most um, public health models. The first step, the step one is the problem is defined. Like Catherine said, this involves collecting data to determine who, what, where, when, and how. So we collect that data from different places, and from that data, we are able to do what we need to do. And then the next thing is, the next step, we want to find out the reason why one person, you notice I say one person, or community experience violence while another does not. So we have to explore that. And then we use what we use scientific methods to explore this. And we look at risk factors. So that we look at factors that um, may buffer against these risk, fa these risk factors. And then we look at pro protective factors and the likelihood of, uh, and the likelihood of viol violence in the face of risk. And we look at violence present prevention aim to this to decrease risk factors and increase productive factors. So in the step three part, we are looking at the prevention strategies. So we develop them as Catherine articulated earlier on, the steps. So these are things that we are doing in terms of what are prevention strategies. We test them, we pilot them, and we share that information with others. And the last step is where the rubber meets the road, where we look at the strategies that are shown to be effective that we use in step three, and we disseminate that broadly, and we implement them. So while many prevention practitioners may need more skills or resources in terms of step one, they, these things can be facilitated. So we need to look at training, technical assistance for the practitioners, and although we, with the step four, it may not be the final step because we have to do the monitoring and the evaluation, the assessment to ensure that the strategy fits that particular community. And I want to say that particular community because sometimes we have a one-size-fits-all strategy and it is not context-based and it is not cultural-specific. So we will want to have something cut blush and say, okay, we're going to do that and then it does not fit that particular community. So a one-size-fits-all prevention strategy will not work for us. We have to ensure we interrogate the cultural, the sociocultural, the political climate in Viewport South, in the Mang, and in Bruceville for us to be able to, do, to be efficient. And I was saying to Catherine um, earlier on where... Um, I lived as Andrew, at Rabin Shabbat when I was a child, and Romanus Slantico decided he wanted to build a market. And he had no, and he just decided he built a market for us. And nobody has, and after I was a young girl, and up, and, and up to now, nobody uses the market. So sometimes we use um, 
we, we develop programs and policies for people who do not need them. And I'm happy that um, Catherine has, is using the public health model, the public health approach to address the issues that we have in Beaufort South. Okay, as I say, I live here. So the, I live in Beaufort South. So I, I, I'm in, it's a passionate for me. Okay, the public health in the, in us, so we look at, we have, there has three levels. They have primary, they have secondary, and they have tertiary level. So then we have some intervention, what they call universal interventions that we, that we have been doing, huh? where we, we aim at large groups of people without regard to the individual risk. So we look at prevention, violence prevention, curricula, things in schools, a generic thing. And then we have what you call selected, inter selected intervention, where we consider where it has high risk, and then we do whatever we have to do from that standpoint. And then we also have what we call indicated prevention, where we look at who have already demonstrated violent behavior and who are perpetrators of violence. So we are here. So um, what does it mean for us in Beaufort South? What does it mean for the decision making on the ground? How can we use these four steps to get what we want? And how do, in terms of the public health approach, okay? So it is against this backdrop that Raise Your Voice Inc. interrogated that approach and determined that it was the best approach to address some of the challenges that we face in Roosevelt and Man. And we have started the process to assist in the provision of psychosocial support for residents, where we talk about it's an all-inclusive thing, men, women, boys, and girls. So let us, as a community, a community in Viewford South, support this initiative so that, we begin to, so that we will begin to heal and to develop peaceful communities. And as a new principal of Sir Arthur Lewis Community College, and of your portion, I will speak to the Board of Go Governors to determine how the South, the South Campus will support the initiative. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Dr. Jameson Charles. Indeed, the South produces good stock, good men and women. In um, Dr. Jameson Charles's presentation, we were reminded that crime is multifaceted. It doesn't affect just the persons who are the, the perpetrators of crime because when we had this moment of unrest in Viewfort, every single person from Viewfort felt it and even around the island. I remember um, one day, I was a Sunday morning, I think it was, we were heading down to Sufre as a family and we stopped in Schwazel and a gentleman asked me, you know, where were we coming from? And I said, Viewfort. And he said, we are praying for you. And in that moment, I'm not from Viewfort town. I wasn't directly impacted. Yes, I lost two friends but I wasn't directly impacted so much by the violence. And I felt a little bit emotional in that moment that the rest of the country cared enough. But this has to be something that Viewfort embraces and runs with. Nobody else can do it for us. Nobody else lives the experience of Viewfortians. Nobody else but persons from the Mang and Bruceville walk and talk and live in Viewfort. And they understand better than anyone else, how much they've been traumatized, what they have lost, and what can be gained from a unified view fort. If we can hold hands with Catherine Sillies and her organization, Raise Your Voice, St. Lucia Inc., if we can hold hands with our parliamentarian, Dr. Anthony, if we can hold hands with our police, if we can hold hands with our youth workers, such as Miss um, Shoma Childs, if we can hold hands with the people of Viewfort and we can work together, I am sure not only will we be able to find the why, but we will find the how. 
and we'll be able to rebuild what which is ours, what is your fault, our beautiful, tranquil community few for it's not lost we just scarred a little and we can overcome at this moment for closing remarks i want to invite um miss rice joseph who is the executive director of the folk research center and also from the community of your fort okay. good afternoon good afternoon everyone I do not wear the hat of executive director at this time, but as Ms. Joseph Sprott said, as a V4 shun from Larry Schuss, who was educated in V4, who continues to live here, and who is looking forward to the successes that will be reaped from this initiative. At this time, my closing remarks are tied to thanks and gratitude, because we take for granted that it took many members of various communities to make this initiative possible, and very often, this is what we need, collaboration, partnership to make strong communities. And at this moment, I just want to thank Udi Mercy, who took Monica to Avayasam, who fed Pujisala, fed a VFO. So to raise your voice in Lucia Inc. for being the strong civil society partner, ensuring that this movement makes a difference, not just in VFO, but throughout St. Lucia, because this week, we also had a historic moment of the sword turning ceremony in union for providing support for the empowerment of women and girls who have been impacted by gender-based violence. We say thank you for standing in the gap because we not only need leadership from our government, but from our civil society. And very often where government and other agencies have not been present, you have been present and so we thank you. Can we put our hands together for Raise Your Voice in Misha? To the government of Canada, we want to also express our profound appreciation for funding this initiative. You are more than a donor because gangs too have money and they can provide funding for a variety of things, but you make a difference in stopping in the gap and saying that we would like to create transformation in the lives of people. And so for your support and your partnership, we are indeed grateful and we thank you. At the local level, I want to recognize at this time the generosity and commitment of the late Dr. Henry Wallace Charles, who was unselfish in sharing his decade-long commitment to youth development and initiatives and partnering with Raise Your Voice St. Lucia in ensuring that even when he has made his transition, the impact on youth and community development is still felt here today, and we are indeed grateful for his work. Often referred to as the grandfather of youth development, we thank him for his initiative, for his partnership, and his willingness to assist to raise your voice in Lucia. <laughs> to Dr. Marjorie Jameson Charles, who we know will deliver great stewardship to Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. We thank you for providing greater insight into the impact of violence from a public health approach and for your commitment to education and transformation in St. Lucia. Thank you very much. <laughs> to the parliamentary representative, Dr. Kenny Anthony, we thank you for your stewardship, your commitment and your endorsement. It means a lot to the people of VA4 that you are here today and that you continue to work alongside all partners who are friends of VFO at this time. And we thank you, and we know that you will make an impact in VFO as you are doing in Haiti as well, in bringing about social peace. Thank you very much. <laughs> to the coaches, the counselors, the volunteers, the person sitting off to my right, who are making a difference, you two are important partners, and we thank you for your time given to the young people of VFO, given to families to make a difference. We thank the young people as well for being willing to come on board and being part of doing good work and sowing good soil in our space. We thank the media for documenting this moment and for ensuring that the positive messaging that we need to go out in St. Lucia and beyond is taken afar for VFO. 
We thank our ushers and all individuals who made today possible. And last but by no means least for Mrs. Eleanor Joseph Sprout for her stewardship in guiding us through today's proceeding. Thank you immensely for your contributions and for your continued partnership beyond today. Because this day started a long time ago. It's a process that continues long after. And we look forward to your commitment, your presence, and your encouragement. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Joseph. Um, we are not yet at the very end of today's program. We have heard all of the lovely deliveries, but now we have some refreshments and our young footballers are going to display some talent. If there's one thing we know about View Foot South, where's Mr. Bellas, Mr. Mervyn Bellas, that we have good football talent in View Foot South. And we have our young footballers here with us who will display such talent. Again, we thank you. We cannot thank Raise Your Voice enough for this initiative. But we know that as the time goes by and we begin to see the fruit um, of this initiative, we'll have even more thanks from the community of Ufort. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your effort. And we look forward to engaging you in the future as we continue to rebuild a better, stronger view fort. I thank you.